Yes, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our webcast program again. Uh, now we are here again in Richard Wolf, the headquarter of Richard Wolf and the River Spine in Germany. And today's uh, program is we're going to uh, con uh, go to the uh, Brazil and connect to the uh, Dr. Marco uh, Moscatelli. He, he is very experienced in uh, endoscopic surgery and he's going to uh, share his experience uh, with us today. Uh, let's continue with uh, uh, Marco. How are you? Hello? Yeah, good, good. Okay, today you are going to share uh, your experience with us and uh, how is it going in, in Brazil? Everything is okay? Okay. Yeah, thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Invited me. Thank you for the invitation. Okay. Uh, after after the after Dr. Uh, Marco's uh, presentation, uh, we will uh, do a, a, a live discussion. Please write your uh, questions uh, to the uh, chat function of YouTube, and then uh, we will uh, read it and uh, try to answer together with uh, Marco. Okay. Let's continue with the presentation of Marco, please. Thank you. So thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to demonstrate some of my knowledge and talk about the main techniques of full endoscopic spine surgery for the whole world in this very delicate period. About three main techniques already present in the other editions of the webcast for Dr. Kong, explained about the compression in the endoscopic spine surgery. Dr. Ali about several techniques and access the lumbar spine and Professor Pramed and Arun, who presented everything about posterior cervical surgery. I will talk about interlaminar approach for the compression of the lateral rectus with possibility of facet cyst excision, transferminal approach for herniation disc with migration and posterior cervical approach for foraminotomy and sectomy. The first observation to make is that all my surgeries are performed under general anesthesia without the use of the eyes and currents and without interpretive monitoring. In the first case, we have a 64 years old male patient with low back pain and sciatica pain in the left lower limb greater than low back pain. 
He has pain with radiation for L5 dermatomy associated with paresthesia and numbness. Lumbar VAS 6, left leg VAS 8, 4 months of conservative treatment before surgery. We can see on MRI the important stenosis of the left lateral rectus with compression of the left L5 root by facet cyst associated with ligaments hypertrophy. Appropriately asked questions is about the pressure of the fluid I use. The vertebral system has an elbow in the scope. You can see here in the, uh, this image. With allows the fluid to escape not only from above but from the sides as the worker's sleeve is circular. Thereby, in the intracanal pressure is kept practically stable. Here is the we can see the intraplanar endoscope, the transplanar endoscope, the materials, the scissor, the punch, and the needle, the guide wire. We put the table in flexion to open the interlaminar window. I will talk about uh, the step-by-step, -step, the interlaminar approach. We start the procedure to mark and identify the central part of the ipsilateral window as media as possible. We inside the, the skin and muscle fascia with the insertion the, of the dilator and later placement of the work sleeve back to this image. We check an AP view and lateral view to make sure the direction of the disc is on correct level. We note in the lateral view that the work sleeve is positioned after the joint keeping us safe, like this line. We have a 25 degrees view with the optics visualizing the structures better. We can see the disc herniation and the medial part of the canal. Here is the sleeve maneuver after put the, the work sleeve into the canal. This is the position of the surgeon looking at the screen, keeping the arm in 90 degrees and keeping the patients as low as possible. We can see how to hold the endoscope comfortably here in my uh, left hand and the opposite side of the materials in the other hand. Most of the time, the materials are safe in the opposite way to what we normally use in the conventional surgery. I will show you now a little bit about the technique. We start the technique with hemostasis and exposure, the lower and upper articular process, as well as remove the super, superficial flavon ligament lamina. We remove it with a shaver, the medial bone, until we saw the insertion of the flavon ligament in the rex. We can use the punch to enlarge the bone window. And now we can only decompress the rexus, remove the cyst, or perform a disectomy if necessary. Now I will talk about my case. This case is L4, L5 left facet joint synovial cyst. We start the procedure by exposing the upper articular process with bipolar, with tip control, and giving up the superficial lamina of the flavon ligament use chip control and the scissor. With the blade protect, we perform bone removal of the upper articular process in a few millimeter, two or three millimeters, nothing more than this. Colleagues asked me how to control bone bleeding. Bone bleeding can be controlled primarily uh, with the, the use of bipolar and increasing fluid. We can also use bone max and the diamond blade.
Now we start the opening of the flavon ligament from medial to lateral because the epidural space is large medial, protecting our initial opening and additional to the curvature of the canal favoring. We can cut in all direction, but it's better to the medial to the lateral. We, we can use the, the work sleeve. And we note the natural, the neural structure is below the ligament. With the punch, we expanded the access for better viewing. With the dissector, we mobilized the neural structure hood of L5 and protect it and with the work sleeve. Now I did the work sleeve maneuver to protect the L5 root and now we can see the left side the root, 9 o'clock, 6 o'clock the veins and the middle part of the, the, the video is the disc. We visualize the facet cyst, and with the scissor, we complete the resection, remove the adhesions. We can see the contact of the, the, the synovial cyst with the, the root. With the scissor, we cut all completely the, the synovial cyst. We visualize uh, the adhesions and remove it, removing the flavon ligament. I don't need to remove the disc. I remove a little bit more bone and flavon ligament to completely free the lateral rexus. And we have to remove all the other reasons to release the root. We see the before and after with the nerve root totally free and with mobilization where we can see the free shoulder and axial And there is other frequently questioned for from colleagues. How to treat a durotomy? Do I need to suture? A durotomy most of the time has no repercussion for your patients. However, if signs of fistula appear, it is possible with clinical treatment with external lumbar drain and clinical measures but I have never had any problem with my patients. The durotomy appears in 10. There is articles talking about uh, 15 percent of the cases in, in the spinal stenosis. Case two. In the second case, we have of male patients 62 years old, with pain in the left lower limb along the root path of L3, L4 of der dermatomy with numbness and paresthesia in this dermatomy. Pain with VAS9 with improvement after three months of conservative treatment. We can see on MRI a L4, L5 disc herniation with cranial migration. With, we see the L4 root coming out above the fragment. The, this headline shows the lower level of the pedicle marking it's possible to remove the migrated fragment. No recommended above this from this level. In the axial section, we note the hernia in the axial of the L4 root and compressing the L5 root in the lateral rexus. Now, I will show you uh, the step-by-step -step of the transformer axis. 
we start the procedure bar marking the midline in AP view and placing it the side view, the lateral view, where we mark the green line referring the tip of the spinous process and the headline in the facet joint line. In, with this, we can enter 15 degrees between the green line and the headline at the L4 level without problem with the abdominal structures. However, the higher it is, the closer the green line we will have to go. We insert the needle and the guide wire in the most posterior part of the disc up to the medial board of the pedicle, always checking in the lateral view. Now we incise the skin in fascia to place the dilator, removing the guide wire. Always I need to check in AP view. The dilator needs to stay in the medial part of the pedicle and medial line. Subsequently, we insert the work sleeve and optica and check another time the medial line of the pedicle. And the work sleeve needs to go, needs to stay in the posterior part of the disc. Now, I will present the case. We start the procedure to visualize the PLL is located in the medial board of the pedicle. We're checking the per AP view. We can see here the disc, PLL, and epidural space without the need for foramen anatomy to improve the access. With tip control, we burn the soft tissues, and here we can see the free fragment, the fragment of the disc. We rotate the opticals to better visualize the tip of the scissors and open the PLL safely. Twelve o'clock the blur space, six o'clock the disc, and with tip control we burn to retract the ligament and exposure better the nerve structures. Is the disc here the free fragment? I take the hunger. And I remove part of the disc fragment with a range in parts. And in sequence, just the rest of the migrated disc along with optical because the fragment is so large. We have to be careful when returning with the optical because the structures may have moved. I remove a little bit more soft tissues and free fragments. I use the tip control like a probe to find the free fragments and burn the disc. I retract a little bit, a little bit the work sleeve. With this. I can see the PLL, the dura space, the disc, and try to find more free fragments into the disc. No more fragments. We can note the fail of the disc, the dura space. We are able to see the disc fail, perform the nucleoplasty. We note the free root, the L5 root. I burn a little bit more, and here, L4 root. Totally free, no more fragments. I burn a little bit more the veins, remove more free fragments, 
around the root, the roots. A little bit more nucleoplasty to find and burn the free fragments inside the disc for reducing the residues. I have more residues in transferminal approach than the interlaminar approach. I don't know why, but now we can see the free root. And the musculature return to the original location. In this case, if you have adrotomy, these muscles helps, helps not to have a fistula. The roots totally free. You can see the root, the muscle, return to the original place. Here are the fragment, the incision, only 7 80 millimeters. Now I will present our last case. The patient is a male, 73 years old, presenting cervical brachialgy with radiation pain in the left CH dermatomy, presenting important paresthesis with VAS 8 and mildegrade 4 neurological deficit. This is the C8 dermatome. On the MRI, we can see C7, T1 herniated disc with compression of the C8 root and metal. You can see in lateral view, in sagittal. In all cases of surgical surgery, it's necessary to perform uh, the CT scan to check if there is a calcification of fragments with marks and the difficulty to remove it. We note in this exam the soft fragment with uh, foramen stenosis. Here, the foramen is narrow. Posterior approach. The cervical endoscope material is more delicate than the lumbar interlaminar material, but everyone asked me if surgery with if I surgery in my surgery if the interlaminar material is possible. Yes, it's possible, and my surgery are done the with this material here in Brazil. All my cervical cases. The pure access to the cervical spine is restricted to the foraminal and lateral pathologies, or what is not necessary to have contact with the, the median extrusors. With this, it is possible to res resect lateral, foraminal disc herniation, and perform uh, foraminotomies. Here is the cervical. I will now show you the technique step by step. I don't use uh, a fixation of head with pins, just a fixation with tapes, so there are uh, no big movements. I find it's very aggressive, the points. believe that uh, um, her shoes fixation is sufficient. And now we mark the medial line and the joint line in AP view. Insert the needle in the lateral mass, like at 1.5 centimeters from the midline. We need to check in the perfume the level and confirm the position of the needle towards the disc to be approached and shows the in this image. 
now I will show you the surgical technique. We remove the needle, incise the skin in the fascia. Subsequently, we introduce the dilator and the work sleeve and check in the perfume. As we can see, we position the work sleeve afterwards, the joint completely safe. Safe as I show in this image. Here we demonstrate our access point and our goal with the partially remove the upper and lower lamina as well as less than 50% of the joint. Uh, other question is how much is necessary to remove the bone to open the foramen? We about the technique, the foramenotomy and sectomy. We start the procedure by removing a few millimeters from the upper and the lower lamina, as well as from the joint for the foramenotomy to be performed. After this step, we can proceed of the disectomy if necessary, like this image. And we remove the, the disc herniation with a little root mobilization as possible, this procedure being indicated only for the lateral and foraminal disc herniations. The posterior sex to the cervical spine is restricted to the foraminal and lateral pathologies. Or what I not necessary to have contact with media structures. With this, it's possible to resect the lecture and foraminal disc herniations and perform foraminotomies. Now I will present our last case. We start our procedure uh, by exposing the bone structures C7 and T1 with tip control removing with a shaver part of the lamina C7 and T1, where we will expand the foramen with the cutting blade and the punch to perform a great foraminotomy. Uh, here I am using the, the punch to remove the flavon ligaments. And after opening the, the, the lamina, we started side open with the shaver and punch. Noting the intimate contact of the bony structure with the neural structures. So dangerous is this step of surgery. After excellent foraminotomy, we note the C8 root with a little vascularization uh, without mobilized and close contact with the disc fragments. We mobilize the root to prepare the, the removal of the extruder fragment where we see the annulus rupture. Here, the fragment in real contact with the root. We remove a part of the fragment, which in several fragments with compression the nerve. Now, I remove the principal part of the fragment with Rohonjo. But we can see there is not more movement and a lot of fragments. We can gently mobilize the root and search more fragments. Now I'm going to the annulus and the adhesions to find and remove more and more free fragments. Continue removing the free fragments. With the probe, we looked for the fragments under the C8 root 
through the arms, through the axle. We check all the time in perfume, we check inside the disc and remove a lot of the soft tissues and the fragments. Now the roots a little bit much better, but it's not complete decompressed. With that, we observe the, that the root becomes more and more loose and with normal shape. More fragments. And now we can see the root better movement and return the vascularization. The roots floating now. The color is much better. You can see before and after. It's much better now. Before and after. Here we can see before and after, and uh, axial and sagittal. In the reconstruction, we can see our approach. The fragments, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fragments, and the incision. Here the MRI, the preoperative, and the postoperative. Here the patient is happy. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Marco, uh, sharing your experience with this nice and excellent um, presentation. Uh, now we will continue with the case, uh, with the questions. Uh, but as you uh, answer all the questions in advance in your presentation, I think we didn't get too many questions. Um, let's start. Let let me check the let me check the function. Uh, okay. Hello, hello, hello. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Okay. From Marco Serra. What's your opinion about stenosis scope, Marco? Uh, hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation another time. Thank you, Ali, Frederick, and Robert. Thank you, Josh. And, and Marco. Marco is a great surgeon from Brazil. He's a great endoscopic surgeon from Brazil. Uh, the, endoscopic, the, 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 the stenosis endoscopic is we are, we are able to, to do a surgery a little bit more fast, to drill the facet joint and the bone and the lamina. But I, I, I think it's not so good to go to the over the top and resection bone the over the top because the endoscope is one millimeter bigger than the, the, the interlaminar endoscope. We can do the surgery a little bit uh, easier with the interlaminar endoscopy. We can go under the, the, the blade, under the lamina, and go to the other side. It's, it's, it's normal, it's good. We use the normal endoscope, the interlaminar endoscope, but the, the stenosis is good. It's very good, it's so fast. It's not good to put the work sleeve and the, the sleeve maneuver because it's, it's so big, you, you put the, the roots to medial, but it's good. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I can comment a little bit my experience on the endoscopic uh, stenosis uh, optic. Uh, first of all, the diameter of the sleeve with the stenosis system is a one centimeter. It's two millimeter more than the regular one. Uh, and as you mentioned, um, 
it's not possible for, from my point to do anterior decompression with a stenosis uh, system. But the stenosis system is really, really good and aggressive to do faster bone resection, especially if you are working with the, with the central canal stenosis, then you need to do only posterior decompression and then it's better to use the stenosis system. It's really fast and, and you can do easily. But like a reset stenosis, additionally the posterior decompression, if you want to do the anterior decompression like discectomy or resection of the osteophytes uh, anterior to the root or the dura, then you cannot rotate this, put the sleeve to the ground and rotate it 180 degree and uh, retract the root to the medial. You, if you do it with a stenosis sleeve, then you, you're going to put a lot of stress on the, uh, on, the, on the root and it's not good. That's why, uh, as a summary, if you want to do uh, anterior decompression addition to posterior, we use the regular uh, vertebral system, but just for posterior decompression over the top or your ipsilateral, it's really good to work with the stenosis. It's really faster. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me check. What are the chances of cervical cord neurological deficit after posterior firm anatomy cervical spine? Okay. Did you have Did you have any experience with the neural cord injury during the endoscopic surgery? No, I never the I never the the the, the depth neurologic in my my cases. I have maybe twenty five cases the cervical approach, mm -hmm. and I never and I never used uh, monitoring my surgeries too. It's not necessary because I I don't go to the medial part of the the, the cord, the medial part. Only the decompression, the 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 flavon is not more dense. But it's the the roots we don't need to protect a little bit more. We can see we we go outside of the canal. We don't go inside of the canal, only the the, the, the rongeur, only the rongeur and the scissor is not a problem. I never had the, the depth neurology in cervical approach. Yeah, you are right. Uh, it's really, it's better to not to put the sleeve inside the spinal canal. Always we, we prefer to work outside of the spinal canal yeah. and only we remove the fragments and uh, the pathologies with our instruments, and then we never we never put the sleeve and rotate it and uh, retract the uh, myelon. It's not possible. Uh, okay. Uh, another question uh, from Facundo Juan Isel: How medial can you go with the posterior cervical approach? What can you repeat, please? Okay. How um, how how medial? Can you go with the posterior cervical approach? Can, another type of the question is, can you retract the myelon? No, yeah. <laughs> okay. We, we never go to the medial part. Yes, I, I, I answered this question and the other question. Yeah, uh, yeah we can put the metal to the, med, the medial. Yeah, only the the, 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 the cervical the cervical surgery is a is, is a cervical to the lateral uh, cases. Yeah, and the foramen and, and lateral rex says you don't go to the medial, you go to the the root, under the root, uh, the axial, the shoulder, but not the metal. You don't need monitoring for this. Yeah, actually, only the possibility from from my side uh, to go with the ronger, and then when you you can you can lift the myelin a little bit with the rongeur and try to catch the fragments from the medial, yes. but you cannot, re it's not good to retract the myelin. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, because and also it's because we have we have some millimeters. We have one millimeter maybe and the metal and dura matter into the, the dura. You are right. Uh, always we tell the participants um, uh, endoscopic surgery do doesn't change the basic principles of the surgery. Yeah. Do you do it yeah. with, the, with the micro? Can you retract the yeah, myelin? Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. And then you cannot retract the myelin with the endoscope. It's the basic principles Perfect. of the surgery. Yeah? Yes. yeah. But only the possibility, you can, you can, with the 25 degree optic, you can go inside the spinal canal just with the optic and lift the myelin a little bit with the rongeur and catch the fragments. This is only the possibility. Only okay. the uh, Another question. Did you ever had any transient deficit by manipulation? Yes, 
I had one in my maybe 20th case. I had one uh, neurological deaths in the L5 route because I was so uh, inexperienced. I don't, I didn't have any experience. But now in my five, 500 cases and 600 cases, I never have more. Okay, thank you. Great. Another question, uh, Marco. Which endoscope do you prefer for later, lateral recess stenosis, uh, stenosis endoscope or usual? Already we answered this question. Maybe we can uh, we can uh, talk an, again. Uh, maybe uh, some participants joined us uh, before we answer these questions. Yeah. Again. Yeah. So I I I prefer the normal one. Mm -hmm. Okay, but. Only, only the, the lateral access, you can go fast with the endoscope to the stenosis in the endoscope. You can go fast uh, to resect more bone, uh, to resect more, more, uh, bla more lamina, um, but it's, you don't need. But it's more, more strong. The endoscope is more strong uh, uh, for the beginners. Mm -hmm. yeah, you you don't, don't, don't broke the, the, the endoscope uh, easy. Yes. It's only this. You're right. Again, uh, if you if if you want to do only posterior decompression, you can for your side or the contralateral side. Just for posterior decompression, the steno you can use the stenosis system. Yeah, it is really faster yeah. and stronger. But additionally, for to posterior decompression, if you want to do anterior decompression like discectomy or osteophyte resection then you cannot r retract the root with the, with the sleeve of uh, stenosis system because it's the diameter of the sleeve with the stenosis system is really one centimeter and it's really big. Uh, it's better not to do that. Okay, another question. Is it possible to switch the scope from stenosis to interlaminar scope intraoperatively? If I, if I want to change the endoscope, yeah. the, I, I, I start my procedure with the interlaminar and, and change it to the, 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 the stenosis. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if the question is usually, uh, the question is like this. Yeah. When you start with the stenosis optic, uh, you see some pathologies anterior to the dura or yes. the root, and then you need, you need to resect it. Then is it possible to, to change it? Yeah, of course, it's technically yeah, possible. Yeah, yeah, yes, technically it's possible. You can change the, the, the work sleeve and uh, the endoscope is, but it's not necessary. You can do all in the, the lumbar spine surgery with the, the inter, interlaminar endoscope or yeah. the transfer endoscope. You can, you, you cannot. Do. Okay, we can, we can answer this question maybe from my side like this. Yeah, okay. You can start with the stenosis system uh, to do faster bone resection, posterior decompression, and then uh, you can change uh, the system to the uh, regular vertebral system. But keep in your mind, when you change the system, if you are using with the, with the flow control pumps, then you have to change the tube set and the calibration of the system because uh, the pump system uh, calibrated at the beginning of the surgery according to the optic which you are working. Yeah, don't don't forget to do that. Otherwise, you cannot get uh, enough uh, irrigation or over or low. Yeah. Okay. Another question: What is the rate of postoperative dysesthesia following lumbar transforaminal decompression? Yeah, this is a good question. This is a normal question. Yeah. You can, you can uh, less the, the, the disease in the, the transferminal approach with the PRET. Okay. You, you don't need to put the work sleeve directly to the, the foramen. You can, uh, you can use the extra foramenal approach to put, put less the, the disease. I use a lot of the extra foramenal approach for the discerniation is very good. And the time of the surgery, you, you don't need to mobilize the, 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 the work sleeve a lot. Yeah. Um, you, 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 you don't need to burn uh, inside the root. Mm -hmm. There is some tips and tricks in the transforming approach to, to put the last that this is. In my, in my case, I have maybe 15, 15 percent of the disease is uh, in 48 hours posterior surgery or 72 in three days and no more than this. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're right. And especially uh, dysesthesia after the transformal approach. My experience is like that. Uh, if you do a lot of movement, as you mentioned, uh, to the cranial or caudal side, uh, then you squeeze the ganglion and the root to the upper uh, pedicle. Then the patient can have a dysesthesia after the surgery. That's why, and also the second um, uh, thing for this is uh, choosing a posterolateral approach. If you choose posterolateral yeah. approach, definitely you put more stress on the, on the root in the, in the foramen, uh, the exiting root, I mean, and you squeeze the exiting root to the cranial side. That's why we prefer to do lateral transformal approach, and only we prefer to, uh, basically, we prefer to do our moments straight uh, forward and backward. Uh, otherwise, if you do the bend the sleeve to the cranial or caudal side, then definitely you squeeze the root. I think this is the uh, basic, uh, things, uh, the, the complications uh, can occur. Okay, uh, Marcio Penna is the second case. Do you think the interlaminar technique would be possible and why choose the transforaminal one? Yeah. Very good question. The other great surgeon from Brazil, from Belém, Brazil. Uh, in this case, I prefer transforaminal approach because I I choose this this approach in this technique, but yes, it's a good uh, approach, the interlaminar approach to do the surgery. Yes, I use normally the the, the interlaminar approach to remove a uh, uh, disc herniation migra migrated, but I want to 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 remove this disc herniation from transforming approach to uh, to take this case and. To develop the the technique transform now in this case in the the, the discrimination migrated, but it's totally possible to go uh, the interlaminar approach is a good access. I use in 80 80 percent of my cases the the interlaminar approach. Uh, surgeons from Brazil uh, knows this. <laughs> okay, um, for my side. If it is possible, it's better to do it transformally because mm -hmm. it is less invasive uh, technique uh, when you compare it with the interlaminar approach because you use the open gate to the spinal canal. But we have some restrictions for transformal approach. Basically, basically, of course, you can increase your indications. And basically, if the foramen is closed uh, by the uh, iliac crest from the lateral side, then we switch to interlaminar approach. And basically, if the fragment of disc herniation or the disc herniation migrated cranially or caudally according to the disc level, again, it's better to do it with the interlaminar approach. As we talked in the previous question, um, if you uh, choose the transformal approach for the migrated disc herniations, then you have to do something more to go straight. Yeah, like you have to uh, you have to go to the cranial side or caudal side. Then you will you will change your direction of the sleeve, and by this way you can easily squeeze the exiting nerve root in the foramen. For example, uh, caudal migrated disc herniations. To reach that, there's, there is a restriction from the pedicle, caudal pedicle. Then what you you can do, you can resect some part of the facet and the pedicle and to reach the caudal side. But we are talking about the minimally invasive surgery. According to my, me, it's better to do it in a 15 minutes with the interlaminar approach to reach the caudal side. Do you agree with this? Yeah. yeah. Yes. This is the basic uh, for me. Okay. Um, your name again. Just a minute. Do you think that every patient with cervical disc hernia and cervical radiculopathy could be done endoscopically? Do you, can you choose yes. for every case, every cervical herniations? Yes, yeah, a good question too. Mm -hmm. uh, I talk about this in the in the presentation, but we we prefer the posterior approach only for the lateral or the foramen uh, pathologies. I did my, I do my surgery in the disc herniation, the lateral rexus, the disc herniation in the foramen, and the uh, foramen stenosis, only for this. The medial disc herniation is not possible to go to posterior because there is the medal, there is the, the, the canal. 
And the interior approach I prefer to go than the ACDF is not difficult for us. One level, two levels, three levels is not, not uh, completely dif different for us. But all cases, all cervical cases, I, I do my surgery in the posterior approach for the lateral, lateral rexes and this prominent stenosis. Yes, and the, the other question is, uh, uh, the prominent stenosis, the grave prominent stenosis with uh, and, uh, osteophytos. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we can remove the osteophytos with the trophene, with the scissor, and it's easier, it's not, not difficult. It's not difficult. And also, you can use the burr, diamond burrs, to resect the Yeah, you can use the yeah. diamond burrs, the, the trephine, and manual trephine, and the, the teaser. Um, another question, Marco. Which type of sheet do you prefer for lumbar discectomy? The works leaf? Yeah. I think it's this. Yes, I prefer the, yes, the bisel, the, 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 the triangle. The degree, the yeah, it's yes. standard for us. Maybe, maybe, uh, Dr. Tandon, uh, Asha, uh, would like to ask to transformal uh, yeah. te optic or interlaminar optic. Of course, you can you can do interlaminar approach with transformal optic also, transformal system, but. Using a longer uh, instruments for the interlaminar uh, approach, uh, it's not very comfortable for the surgeon. You have to take a more uh, steps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also uh, another problem with the with the longer optic for interlaminar approach. Maybe while you are doing a, while you are using the kerosene for the lateral part, then you can bend, bend. more and you can yeah. easily break the endoscope with the with the, with this technique that it's better to use the interlaminar optic for interlaminar approach in my opinion yeah but, but with with when 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 we have a, a, some experience you can use uh, the transfer net approach and the interlaminar approach and the cervical one you have a pretzel but it is not perfect for this sure oh yeah, yeah. okay that That was not the question, okay. Um, I mean, how do you decide what hernias are out of the scope of the approach? Sorry, I didn't get this question. Yeah. I didn't get this question. We have uh, uh, chips and tricks and six and six, seven cervical disectomy and x-ray. Maybe we can back, we can come back to this question. Uh, later, I will check it. Um, any tricks to improve X-ray visualization to C67 disc space? 67 disc space yeah. during cervical discectomy. Sorry. Yes, it's, it's good because it's, it's the same as the, the anterior cervical approach, but the other side. You you can put the, our patients with uh, with a material here in the the chest and flex the, the neck and put their arms down with a tape. I put the tape here, put the, the, the arm down here, but it's, it's easy. C6, C7 is, is easy. It's more difficult in C7, T1. Yeah, okay. Uh, probably Dr. Facundo uh, would like to ask this. Yeah, he, he asked, the question, how medial can you go with the posterior cervical approach? And then he uh, wrote again another question. How how do you decide what hernias, what type of hernias are you, uh, do you choose for the posterior approach? I think you answered this question for the lateral herniations, yeah. the foramenal and the lateral herniations. Perfect. For the central uh, herniations, there might be an option anterior cervical discectomy or the conventional one, the ACD. But, my but this question is, this question is uh, the cervical or cervical, the, cervical. all the spine? No, no. Cervical, okay, think, okay. Yeah, because Dr. Kokundo okay. asked about the cervical posture approach. Okay. Okay. Uh, is ACDF procedure obsolete in your practice after experience with the posture endoscopic cervical spine? No, never, never. The ACDF is a good, a good procedure. I use the ACDF, and 
so many cases. Uh, the central, the central disc herniations, or if my patients have a metal patchy for the compression for the interior, yes. Yeah. I use, I use, I use. Of course, we use a it's lot a, the ACD yeah, procedure. It's, a good, it's, it's standard, a good, gold standard. It's a good procedure. Yeah. Uh, we choose. My opinion, my experience is like that. We choose the po uh, posterior cervical approach for the lateral herniations. Yeah. If if the central herniations with the calcified all the way there, <laughs> like this again, yeah. the approach is the ACDF. Uh, do you use steroid in, intradiscally or periartically after well, the operation? Only the only the only the end of the surgery. I put uh, I put my work sleeve. I I did, I do a, a sleeve maneuver. Uh, remove my the, the the fluid and put my steroids. Uh, into the canal, yeah. only this. Okay, um, maybe there is a trick here, you know, um, if you want to put a steroid or some material uh, after the surgery, there is a small trick I can recommend you. Uh, you, you can remove the, take out the scopes and uh, leave the sleeve inside the spine and then uh, put the dilator in, but please uh, keep the opening of the holes of the dilator yeah. Open, and then let the water goes out, out, and then you can put the steroid or marcaine or lidocaine. Uh, then again, you can push this uh, dilator into the spine, but please close the openings of the dilator well, with the your thumb, yes. and then you can push the uh, material inside the spinal canal. This is a small trick. Maybe you do it. For knowledge, yes, of course, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Another question, uh, how do you manage the dural tear? Okay, our common yeah, question. Yeah, as I told you, yeah, as I told person, you. <laughs> every webcast, of course, they, they are right to of ask course. this. Yeah, be, be, this can be happen during the surgery and how we manage it. Yeah, please. Yeah, this uh, dural tear appears in maybe 15% of the cases of the stenosis, but it's not normal dural tears, okay? Uh, how can I, I, I do my, 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 in my cases? Duratis is not, not a problem in most parts of the cases. I never, I never had a, 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 a fistula. The liquor goes uh, to the, the skin, but I have one case. I had one case that the patients uh, did, a, did a compression, epidural compression uh, after, after duratis. But it's, it's, we, we don't need to suture the dura tears. Uh, maybe I can put a, 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 a cotton, no, I don't know the name, uh, the gel one, I don't know. Duragene okay. or something like that. Yeah, it's like something like that to stop the, the, the hole. But it's, it's not a problem, dura tears. You can go to the, your surgery, uh, finish uh, your surgery, I, I, I put the fluids a little bit more down. I increase my uh, I decrease my my fluid and stop my surgery. It's no problem. Yeah, I can maybe I can comment on this uh, also from my experience. Usually the dural tears are not bigger than the two millimeters during the endoscopic surgery, but of course it depends the the, the size of uh, the dural tear. The dural tears. If if you see if you see like the fibers are aggressively coming out and of course there is no chance to go. You can switch to open surgery and repair it. But as yeah. you as you told us, uh, usually they are very small. But again, you can see some fibers are coming out. At that moment, there is a trick. You can you can stop the irrigation and then uh, the, you can put the fibers inside the dura with the dissector also and then you can continue the, the operation and after the operation uh, it's possible to put some uh, barriers on, on the dura and leave it like that and um, for example when we start with professor jambola in turkey in our, at the beginning of our learning curve when we face the um, dural tear first time in our learning curve then we immediately we switched to open surgery and we had a CSF leakage after the surgery and a fistula after the surgery. And uh, after that time, we never switched to the open uh, repair. 
And then because we understood that, we don't dissect the muscles from the bone during the surgery. This is the main yeah. advantage of endoscopic uh, technique. We dilate the muscles. When you remove all the system after the surgery, all the muscles are closing again. And my opinion, this prevents uh, the CSF leakage after the operation. Yeah? I can comment like this. Maybe it is the same. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, perfect. Your, uh, perfect explanation, yeah. Okay. Uh, another question. Have you any experiences anterior cervical approach? What are the indications for your appearance? Do you have an experience with the anterior approach? No, 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 no. Only, only in our, in our symposiums, uh, I, I never realize in my patients. I don't believe in this, uh, the, the anterior approach. Oh, okay. I prefer the CDF, yeah. Okay. Thank you. You choose you choose the lateral herniations for posterior posterior approach. Perfect. We, we, Perfect. We already told this. In cervical cases where the root is adjust, adjacent to the pedicle or the vertebra and the behind the root is an osteophyte, what do you do? In the osteophytes cases in in anterior part of the the root. Yes, we can mobilize the root. You open a little bit more your forearm into to upper and lower lamina, and you can mobilize two or three millimeters this this root. And with a trephine, a manual trephine, you can remove this the osteophytos uh, with a scissor or, or a, a a trephine or a a, a diamond bloom, uh, burn. You can remove this, no problem. You need to take care because the root is so close, the, the pathology and the foramen is, is narrow. Okay, another question. What's your percentage uh, with the interlaminar and transforaminal? What my, my number case is the yeah. transforaminal, well, the percentage, oh. okay. I, I use maybe 20% of my cases, the transforaminal approach. I, I, I only realize the, 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 the transferring approach in the foraminal pathologies or extra foraminal pathologies. I prefer a transferring approach. The foramen stenosis, this craniation uh, in the foramen or extra foramen um, or one, one disc biopsis, uh, the seats, the treat or uh, one deceit maybe. Um, most of part, mo most part of the time, I prefer the interlaminar approach in the lumbar spine. Okay, thank you, Marco. Another question: In the second case, you choose to go directly transformal. Are you, are you not scared to squeeze the exiting nerve in the foramen because the herniation was partially uh, in the foramen? Is starting extra foramenal not safer? Very good questions. Yeah, uh, I, I saw my exams uh, before the surgery and this foramen is, uh, is big, was big. It's no problem to do this because I had a, a component into the canal and that's the canal. But the extra foramen approach is a good, good approach. I use most part of the, my surgery, of my surgeries, the extra foramen approach. It's so common, it's, it's easier. Uh, is very good. I use the extra foramen approach. No, my foramen was is a big foramen, L4, L5 in this case. The patient was big. It's not not problem. Yeah, uh, maybe I can comment on in this. Um, uh, to 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 do uh, foraminal disc herniations or extra foraminal disc herniations, we have two options. Uh, First of all, you have to check the caudal side of the foramen from the preoperative images from MRI or something like that. Uh, if you see a free space at the caudal side of the foramen, then you can directly go, you can do the regular transforaminal, normal transforaminal approach, and you can pull back your sleeve and rotate it to the cranial side to, to, uh, to reach the uh, herniation extraforaminally or foraminally. Uh, but mm -hmm. if you if the foramen is really stenotic and if the pathology is you can if you, you cannot identify where is the exiting narrow then 
uh, it's better to do pure extraforaminal approach means that starting from extraforaminally we duck with the needle to the junction of pedicle to the ascending facet and then prepare the anatomical structures first to go inside the foramen. Uh, I think you choose, uh, you decided like this, I think you, you saw the free space in the caudal side and you did the regular Yeah, regular yeah that's perfect. This is and possible, it, of and course. We, and with a lateral approach, we don't need to remove uh, the foramen. You don't need the foraminotomy to go to the foramen. Sure. Is, is, you can see the foramen in front of you. Okay, if possible, please do a webinar specific for cervical anterior posterior indications. Already we did, yeah. Okay, maybe well, in the cervical. future uh -huh. we can do later again. Yes. Okay, Marco, I think we are end of uh, our questions. Um, may I ask you, uh, Marco, how you started in Brazil, the endoscopic procedure? What's your experience? Could you please uh, tell us the story? Be yes, the uh, spine endoscopic surgery in Brazil started in 2008 with a professor, Hot Vargas, was my professor. Uh, and I start my, my procedures uh, six years ago. Okay, I, I stayed with him in my in my residence in my trainment uh, for 10 years okay but i started alone six years ago uh i bring this technique maybe to natal uh, six years ago and i start my surgeries uh here is not so easy in the beginning here because the procedure is is started here in brazil but he was fine spread the, the technique around the world in Brazil is not different. Uh, we have a lot of surgeons and endoscopic surgeons here in Brazil. Uh, it's a good surgeons. And we have we have uh, our our courses, our training here, our symposiums. Uh, in Natal I I create a, a symposium in cadaver lab two two times per year in maybe in in may and in november and in campinas with professor hot vargas we have maybe eight three trainments trainings uh during the year in campinas in model is a good training for the beginnings and we, we can try to to mobilize the material with the, the, the model is good. And I have a, a, a fellow, a fellow, the persons around the world goes here, around Brazil, he goes here, stay with me one, two or three days, entering my case and see my surgeries and treatment and the models with him, with me here, he, okay. Okay, that's great. Uh, also, may I ask you, if, uh, if uh, one of our colleagues in Brazil wants to start the procedure, um, is it possible from your side to help them in their OR also, in the first case? Yes, it's, yes, it's totally possible. Me and Professor Vargas, I take my plane and go to the, the other cities and, and help other colleagues. Uh, maybe I have uh, 200 surgeries with other colleagues here in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot of surgeries. Yeah, that's great option for for the surgeons it's who a great, wants to, it's, who it's, wants it's to so start. Safe. It's I, it's really safe yes, uh, I, to start with the experienced surgeon directly. Yeah. Because, uh, Always I believe need... he, I believe it, I believe the surgeons needs more maybe 20 surgeries without a uh, 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 other surgery more experience. Okay, great, great. Thank you very much, Marco, uh, helping us. Thank you very much. A lot. Maybe uh, we have another question. What size endoscope Marco uses in posterior cervical? Is it the same as transfer mm, yeah, I use in my cervical approach uh, the interlaminar endoscope because we don't have uh, the cervical endoscope here in Brazil now. We don't have the, the registration, the, this material here. And I use the interlaminar endoscope is not problem. The difference not the endoscope to the cervical is the the rongeur sure. and the scissor. 
You need Only a smaller ones. ones. Yeah, you need. Yeah, yeah so I need the ones is, the smaller ones. It is one. possible to do posture cervical with the uh, interlaminar uh, instruments, but you have to have a two millimeter rongeur and the Caesar and the smaller uh, burrs for the cervical. Uh, yeah, of course, the, the great optimal uh, instruments are the cervical op optic and the cervical uh, sleeve. But if you don't have in your hand, then you can do it with the interlaminar instruments. But as you mentioned, please have the two millimeter rongeur, smaller dissector, yes, it's better. and the uh, smaller scissors. And you, need, and you need more and more, more experience to, yeah. to yeah. use the uh, interlaminar approach in the cervical, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, let me check if we have another question or not. I think... Uh, Ah, uh, questions for Rivo Spine. They are asking for us. <laughs> what are yeah. the indications for using anterior cervical approach, your opinion? Uh, already you answered this question. We, we choose the posture approach for the lateral herniations. And we, if you want to do, uh, if do discectomy for the central herniations, you can choose the anterior approach. Uh, but I don't, personally, I don't have uh, too much experience with anterior surgery. Uh, but we know that uh, our colleagues from Asia, they do a lot of anterior surgery, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Marco. We don't have more uh, questions. It was really uh, good to see you here also. Uh, we were planning to be together in the symposium in, uh, in the Herne, uh, but you know the situation we have, we postponed it. Uh, maybe uh, next symposium, uh, September? September, yeah. yes, yes, yeah, September. Okay, then thank you very much again, Marco. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, our colleagues. Thank you very much, all the Heavy Spine group and okay. believe in us. And I, I hope you see in September and all their colleagues. Okay, thank you. Thank very much, you very much. much. Have a nice day. Uh, thank you very much for joining our webcast. Uh, we are closing now, and uh, we will we will do more activities like this in difficult days. Please stay safe and have a nice day. <laughs>